Good afternoon, my name is Neil Conan, and we're here today to talk about the relationship between conservation and tourism. Uh, let me begin by belaboring the obvious, as important as these interests are, uh, these are not the only players involved. Obviously, there are people who live adjacent to uh, conservation areas, some of whom have indeed been uh, expelled from conservation areas, and too many of these people are, of course, living in poverty. There are agricultural interests, logging interests, mining interests. There are uh, military groups of various types, some associated with the government and some not. Uh, there are, of course, the governments themselves, which can be incompetent, corrupt, indifferent. Uh, they can devolve into civil war, occasionally even into genocide. Uh, there are others, of course, who are better. There are international players like the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank, who can sometimes see expenditures on conservation as an uh, inefficient use of precious resources. Uh, nevertheless, we are here to focus on the relationship between conservation and tourism, which is an important subject and vital. We have four panelists. You see their uh, credentials up there on the screen. I will introduce each in turn. Uh, they will make a presentation. We'll have some conversation amongst ourselves and be happy to take some questions from the audience in just a few minutes uh, thereafter. Uh, let's begin uh, with uh, Liz uh, McPhee, who's with the Great Ape Conservation and Tourism Program. I am going first to give a, um, give a, a presentation of a, an idea related to ecotourism as it applies to great apes and um, to basically take, um, take a conservative approach to it. And uh, we were asked to discuss this topic of, um, of great ape tourism and whether it is, um, in, in theory anyway, we, whether it is ecotourism. Um, we've talked about there's an option of calling it nature tourism, but nature tourism is not really something that gives anything back. The definition of ecotourism is that there are a number of benefits that are given back to conservation, to local communities and beyond. Um, so um, I am actually um, the lead author of a, a document that was written with contributions by a number of people that are in this room, uh, which is the best practice guidelines for great ape tourism. And in that document, when we talk about whether we can consider great ape tourism as ecotourism, we actually say no. We think that um, there are too many potential negative impacts. Um, in this slide that's up now, I. Um, need to point out that, that the, this, this graphic, I'm not going to go into it, but obviously is a, uh, a list of all the potential inc impacts of tourism and a number of positive impacts and a number of negative impacts. But the fact that there are so many potential negative impacts is the reason why we did not choose to call Great Ape Tourism ecotourism. There are, there are too many things, there are too many risks that can go wrong. And so therefore, under the strict definition of ecotourism, with a minimum or zero impact on the target species that you're visiting, uh, we think that this is, is not a term that we can apply to great ape tourism. So I'm taking the conservative approach in this. Um, there are a number of impacts in this, in this um, graphic. There are impacts that we know that are documented impacts. We don't yet know if they're positive or negative. There's behavioral change impacts. We don't yet know whether, whether those are going to have a negative impact on the conservation of apes. However, they may, and therefore we can't just ignore them. Um, and there may be future impacts that we haven't yet been able to research and, and describe. So um, as a result of that, um, we think that there is an opportunity to work towards the definition of ecotourism and by implementing the best practice guidelines, which um, we have, um, not got a number of copies of with us, but there is a link for the download that's up here and we'll make sure that everybody has it. Um, but in implementing the best practice guidelines as described in this document, uh, produced by the IUCN Primate Specialist Group, we feel that sites that are currently implementing great ape tourism or are con considering implementing it could optimize the impacts and get a little bit closer to approaching that definition of ecotourism. Um, so, we were asked in this session the question, can ecotourism save great apes? I've put in this word, all. Can ecotourism save all great apes? And I would say the answer to that is a definitive no. It cannot. There are too many sites, there are not enough tourists, 
Uh, we need to have some sites uh, and populations that are not exposed to tourism. And uh, we know that an un unregulated tourism, which is what would take place in many sites, is extremely dangerous and, and risks the extinction of the very animals that you're trying to save. Um, however, an adjunct question is, can ecotourism save some great apes? And I would say the answer to that, from my perspective, is yes, but only in a very limited number of sites. We've heard quite a lot about mountain gorillas already, and there is a potential to replicate that site, uh, the, the, the success in that site, but not everywhere, and, and in fact, in a very small number of sites. So, um, so that's my take on the answer to that question. Um, so I, I'm, we're going to be very brief because what we're hoping is we're going to have a lot more discussion about, uh, about this with members of the audience amongst the panel. Um, the thing that I would like to suggest that we're trying to move forward now beyond the existing sites and beyond the production of these documents in best practice guidelines, uh, what are the things that we can do? And I think one of the issues that we have a big problem now is that we have complacency in existing sites. We have successful programs that are making a lot of money and um, very famous and um, uh, contributing much to the conservation of the target species. But because we haven't yet had the drastic event, we're complacent and we're allowing some of the procedures that were put in place, we're allowing them to slip. And um, for example, gorilla tourism, starting off with mountain gorillas, this, this picture is what the ideal was. This is where we started with, uh, with tourists visiting gorillas, viewing them from great distances, taking pictures, um, staying very, very far away. Unfortunately, we've allowed things to slip just a little bit, and um, we now have situations like this. Now, I'm going to leave this up for a little while, just for you to zero in and figure out that there is actually a major problem in this picture that, is, um, that everybody seems to be terribly happy about. I am extremely unhappy about this tourist <laughs> that has joined the group. And um, these are the sorts of things that we are not paying enough attention to, and these are the things we need to fix. And these are the things that any other site that would adopt great ape tourism needs to, needs to address. Um, your target species cannot join the tourists, cannot sit with them with park staff looking on um, relatively unconcerned. Um, we also have this. This is a huge problem. Uh, we have over-habituated apes visiting tourist infrastructure, and this has to be fixed. Um, not wanting to single out gorillas, we also have this. This is a big problem. Um, there is with orangutans as well. So um, we have sites where tourists are getting very, very close to apes and um, situations where apes can be injured, human, humans, tourists can be attacked, disease can be transmitted back and forth. This has to be avoided and, and we need to work on it. So I think that's our key challenge moving forward. Um, then other things that I think we should be trying to do coming on from here, we could consider a very limited rep rep replication in a very few sites. There are some other places that might adopt and adapt gorilla tourism, uh, sorry, um, great ape tourism to their additional sites, whether it's gorillas, whether it's chimps, uh, whether it's orangutans or bonobos. Um, the, the, the fact is that it, whenever you see a site that is looking for a means of achieving financial sense sustainability, they are um, considering adopting ecotourism. We can't do it in every site. The market won't, won't bear it. So that is something to consider, but on a very limited basis. We need to educate tourists so that we have consumers of this product that are very aware and that are not happy touching an animal or sitting with an animal. Um, that's a, a, a program I think we need to take forward. And I think, based on, we've seen it in a number of the other sessions uh, yesterday, uh, that we need to consider certification of some of the players within ape tourism. And uh, we discussed it in, in the sessions yesterday. And I think it's something we should consider. So um, I'm not going to go through this slide. This is uh, the guiding principles of great ape tourism as described in the best practice document. Uh, but I want, just wanted you to pay attention to the very last, oops, sorry, done it again, the very last um, point, which is that 
conservation has to be the primary goal for any great ape tourism effort. And it, uh, the tourism itself is a tool to fund the conservation effort that, that we, are, we are undertaking. I think we're gonna have a chance to hear from people in the panel in the private sector and people who are focusing on community tourism. And we do need to make sure that um, communities benefit and that private sector, it, they are key, key players, but they can't be the, the profit can't be the driving force in great ape tourism. Uh, let's uh, move down the couch to uh, Anna Bay Mazzucera from the International Gorilla Conservation Program in Kigali. Great. And diving into the model which is touted, which is mountain gorilla tourism, and looking at what the current situation is and what some of the 21st century pressures are for mountain gorilla tourism. Well, what I, what I will say is I'm here on this panel representing the International Gorilla Conservation Program, or IGCP. And IGCP and our predecessor um, organization, the Mountain Gorilla Project, we have been proponents of the use of, of tourism as a conservation tool for the conservation of mountain gorillas. So I'm, I'm sitting here um, <coughs> representing 30 plus years of of implementation of tourism as a conservation, conservation tool. And there are many people in the audience here that have played a role at a different period of time in the development of what is now considered the model. But again, what I'd like to do is to take us a little further into what this model is um, that we're, we're exploring taking to other great apes. So if you go back to the origins of mountain gorilla tourism, we were really looking at a situation where this was before the terms ecotourism, if they were even um, already in use at that time, it wasn't a widespread use. There's some debate, I did some research looking at uh, at what point in time did the term ecotourism um, come to be coined and when did it get some, some traction? And some, there's some debate about it, what, what's, what's um, What's true is that when mountain gorilla, when mountain gorilla tourism um, was being developed, ecotourism, this phrase didn't really exist. What was going on is that the gorilla habitat was being encroached on and even slated for conversion for agricultural purposes. So that was the evolution and the origins of mountain gorilla tourism. It was really a stopgap measure um, in, a, in a way to protect the remaining mountain gorilla habitat. And since that time, even though these weren't necessarily in the plans for those that were working on mountain gorilla tourism, there are many different elements that have come into play over time. Again, it wasn't originally designed for these, um, but I wanted to give you some sense of other opportunities that have pre presented themselves over time. Um, and these include tourism enterprise. And just to give some reference, um, in 2012, for those enterprises, the, the associations and cooperatives that IGCP has worked with over time um, grossed 566,000 US dollars in revenue in one year time from tourism enterprise. There's also formal schemes for revenue sharing in the three countries. And for, for 2012, I'll give you that figure for the amount of of money generated by the park authorities that then gets funneled back specifically for the local communities in the area. And that figure for 2012 was 578,000 US dollars. Um, unfortunately, that represents only Uganda and Rwanda, as insecurity in the Democratic Republic of Congo has meant that they aren't generating tourism revenue. So that's something we should keep in mind in terms of how successful can we be in a context where tourists are not able to safely get um, on the ground. Um, so these are, and I would go into extreme conservation, but there's a panel on that um, topic in, in, the, in the coming days. So these are some of the opportunities that have presented themselves since mountain gorilla tourism was originally developed. And what we can say is that tourism has played a major role in the conservation of mountain gorillas. Since its development, that encroachment, the potential conversion on a, on a large scale, did stop. Um, but what I'd like to go into is some of what I consider the 21st 
century pressures on mountain gorilla tourism. Um, one of the situations that we're facing, and I think we really can't ignore, is that there's increasing pressure on the protected area authorities to generate revenue from mountain gorilla tourism to drive the development agenda in the three countries. Not only increased revenues from tourism, but also to increase investment in tourism. And this is something that is going to continue to increase and something that, that us in, in the conservation field uh, really can't ignore. And I would say it's, it's very similar to what has been discussed in other panels in terms of the pressure for extractive industry, conversion for, for agriculture. Some of those same themes I'm, I'm seeing um, in the current context of mountain gorilla conservation. There's even um, to the point of several infrastructure development projects that, that are being discussed and, and looked at that, that we in IGCP feel could have a negative impact on the very same um, populations of mountain gorillas that are driving tourism. So I think it's, it's you know, from, from where we are on the ground, I think we are reaching or have reached a point where mountain gorilla tourism isn't really a tool for conservation, but looked at as a tool for development. And so that's, that's something, tool for development on a national scale and a regional scale. Um, but I wanted to say that the pressure isn't just um, from politics in the region. I wanted to ask, just by a show of hands, who's seen this um, clip touched by a wild mountain gorilla? And I'll tell you, when, when you're on the ground talking to tourists, nearly all of them have seen this, this video before they, they get on the ground. Um, so I wanted to build on what Liz just, just said about, we have a real challenge here. This is another 21st century pressure that we're facing in that we have social media. We have all these images that people are exposed to before they get on the ground. And I will say that with the average mountain gorilla exposed to 1,500 at a minimum tourists a year, um, this ex prolonged exposure really does have a risk. We haven't seen the major consequences. So I wanted to take it one step further and, and issue a challenge to all of us, especially the media and the private sector in the room, that we no longer use, distribute in any way any image or video that shows people too close to mountain gorillas. Because I will say that this pressure on the scale that we're looking at in terms of mountain gorilla tourism is a serious threat to the population. And instead of taking it as a restrictive sense, I think the challenge is how do we make tourism, tourist expectations um, before they even reach the ground. So we're not looked at as being restrictive. We have to look at a way of making this fun, creative. Um, we have to, to look at this in, in the campaign sense. Of, of getting beyond our conservation construct and, and making it something that people willingly want to do and, and the private sector as well. Um, so how do we move from here? I think the, the key for, for mountain gorilla tourism is that we need to strive for best practice and, and we're not there yet. Um, and I will say because of the potential, both positive impacts from tourism to mountain gorilla conservation, as well as the potential negative impacts um, of tourism to mountain gorilla conservation. Actually, tourism has emerged as one of the key areas that IGCP will continue to, to work with um, in the next five years. So with that, I'll leave it. And, and we'll move next down to uh, Praveen Maman of Volcano Safari, which operates uh, lodges in, uh, in Rwanda and Uganda. Thank you very much, Neil. As Neil has said, I'm the founder of Volcano Safaris. We work in Uganda and Rwanda. Uh, we have our own lodges. Um, none of them were portrayed in these pictures mercifully. <laughs> and we worked, we worked with gorillas and chimpanzees for 17 years. But before I start my presentation, I have something sad to do, and that is to recognize a very young talent that died yesterday in Nairobi, a young colleague and friend of ours called Ros Lang Ross Langdon who was Australian and who worked for volcanoes for the last, four, last few years, was killed in Nairobi yesterday with his partner. 
uh, he helped build our lodge in Western Uganda called Chambura Gorge Lodge, which was our main chimpanzee lodge. And I'd like to start with a short clip of the lodge that he built with us. <laughs> Thank you, Ros Langdon, you will be remembered. Now, in my talk, I want to look at various things that have been touched on by my colleagues in a different way. And my view of national parks, conservation, and tourism, and communities um, has developed over the last 17 years of working in Uganda and Rwanda. And some of it may be in um, contradiction to what some of it has been said, but a lot, I think, will be in parallel. But my basic concern at the moment is the paradigm of conservation and what it represents in the 21st century. And I really believe, and I want to be provocative about that, how we get ourselves as part of the mainstream in conservation and in tourism and face the global business realities of today. And the word profit came up as a negative thing. To me, profit is not a negative thing. The entire United States economy, the birth of this country, the prosperity of this country is based on profit. If that profit is misused or it's not made ethically, it's another matter. But profit drives a country. It drives development. It handles poverty. And the poor in, Af poor in Africa want also to have their poverty addressed. So I'm not against profit. I'm all for passion. But in recent years, I've understood that profit is more important to drive both the things that are profitable and ethical and also the things that you have to do for communities. Um, Jackson Hole, of course, is the perfect place to discuss all this, especially for those of us who were once born in the wild places of Africa, which are sadly disappearing every day. Protecting wilderness space, national parks, cherishing the environment, the wildlife and landscapes developed in areas like Wyoming are very central to many parts of the world. They also became the model, of course, for protected areas in Africa. Yellowstone, America's first park, as we know, was established in 1872. Park de Virunga is where the gorillas live in Africa, was created in, eight, in 1925, the first national park in Africa. And this is an interesting development from that period. If you look at the work of Ansel Adams, the master landscape recorder, who was a great hero of mine, and a passionate national park defender, he described in a way this ethos in a romantic and a practical way. And he said in one of his uh, addresses, wilderness or wildness is a mystique, a religion, an intense philosophy, a dream of ideal society, phenomena of an advanced society, and a unique contribution to the democratic idea. Now, this is powerful stuff, and this is what has driven protected areas since that time. And this romantic dream of wilderness, as it happens, is how I was brought up by my father, and why I have the Malda freak and chase the blue skies of Africa. The difference between my father and I was that he didn't try and bottle it in tourism. He just enjoyed it and I think he was the wiser for it. But the conservation, con conserv con conversations here today show the really tough situation we're all in, which I think we all agree about. And I think we have to face the reality if we have any hope of saving the great apes. 19th century romanticism that many of us have been brought up with will not stop the oil installations, the trucks of miners, the loggers, and the oil people, oil people as pictures by Andrew Segoya, the director of Uganda Wildlife Authority, showed yesterday, and many other people have shown the living reality of Africa today. The poor countries of Africa and the poor communities also want a slice of the growing wealth of the rich countries. So conservation and tourism must become mainstream, must find a way of delivering economic livelihoods 
Otherwise, it'll be history. And that's what we must do if we are to stay relevant in the dramatic changes that are going on in Africa in this century. This, the, what I witnessed in the last 17 years in Africa, I had not seen in the previous, I don't want to say how old I am, the previous 100 years that I've been on the planet. <laughs> it is dramatic and it is getting dramatic, more dramatic every day. So Africans want a share of what we take as a right, education, health, economic development, and a better future. And this is what we need to work in. We, of course, as a company, do these lodges, which I've shown you a clip of, but we also have got more and more involved in community projects, which I don't have time to discuss with you in detail. But the Volcano Safaris Partnership Trust, which you'll be able to read about on Facebook and on our website, now has major programs of very small scale, sustainable, participatory projects in and around our lodges to make sure that local people sh share in what we are doing. It's a small effort. Many other lodge companies in Africa do it. We're certainly not the only one, but we need to do more of this. So women's cooperative for, co for, for coffee, for making honey, for farming techniques, for creating children's playgrounds. These are the issues that we all need to address. And then bigger issues, providing water, providing sanitation, because the state is unable to do this. And we are in this very awkward situation of creating these luxury ghettos for our clients, for our guests from the rich world, where the poor around us have nothing. And these are challenges we must all face. And especially those of us who have worked in Uganda and especially in Rwanda, it has been very, very challenging for those of us who started setting up tourism in the aftermath of the genocide. How do you set up things in countries where people die in front of you because they don't have water? So balancing this is very important to me, as is profit. I'm not at all, I, and I think the two go hand in hand, in my opinion. And I'd just like to show um, in a minute the slide of a project we have put up at uh, Mount Gahinga in southern Uganda, which is another interesting kind of story because there's a landlock there's a landless community here called the Batwa. Many of you, of you will be familiar with them, the original inhabitants of the Central African forests. And we've had them begging at our lodge gates. We've had them intoxicated and being antisocial. And most of these years, we've tried to ignore them and get them out of the way. That's been the reality you face. And now, after 18 months of work, we have tried to see if we can integrate them in some way in our lodge. And I'd just like to have a second clip, if I may. <laughs> So in summary, I'd just like to say this, if I may, Neil. To me, tourism is essential, but it must be very carefully controlled and, very, and the guidelines I support fully, and every company must as well. If you don't have tourism, the gorillas and the other great apes will die because nobody will take an interest in, in them. If you have too much tourism, they will also die. So it's that delicate balance we must do. And I think the same model of trying to export, of trying to create tourism with conservation and communities linked together has to be the formula. I don't think there are enough partnerships. I think there are too many people who work in their own way. And there is a kind of hesitance and a suspicion of the private sector. And I think that's a, that's a problem. That's the missing link that can drive many things. The same model could also be taken to the Congo Basin where the, the apes are more threatened, but that will require public-private partnerships. And I understand some are starting in Gabon, and I hope more will happen. Thank you, sir. And let's go now to uh, Ken Manakaran, 
uh, who is the managing director of uh, 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 Red Ape Encounters in Sabah in Malaysia. Good afternoon. Um, unlike gorilla tourism, orangutans are very different species, and uh, most of the orangutan tourism in Malaysia and in, and in Indonesia is actually NGO run or influenced. And most of this, again, deal with rehabilitated orangutans. Now the question I want to ask is, should we promote tourism in such areas? Because you get, uh, I guess, all the bad stuff you've been seeing, close contact, um, and, and people getting hurt quite a bit, actually. Some people get their fingers cut off, a uh, bit off, faces scratched, and cameras stolen. But no, it's true, it's true, it's very true. But if we keep doing that and just promoting areas where, uh, where you have, let's say, infrastructure already set up, where it's easy for people to go and see orangutans, where you get quite a bit of money going into, let's say, Sepilok, Sepilok Orangutan Rehabilitation Center in Sabah welcomes about 1,000 people per day. And you have about maybe four or five orangutans at a time. Now, these are at feeding stations, but there's no uh, secure, well, I wouldn't say secure, there is no barrier for the orangutans to get to you. So they can be right where the tourists are. And this happens quite a bit. So there are negative aspects to great ape tourism, for sure. I want to talk about the company I'm running. Now, it's a privately run company because we, we, we say it's a non-government um, initiative. Although it's supported by the Sabah Wildlife Department, we are given permission to bring a very limited number of tourists into a research site. And that's, this research site has been studied by the NGO Hutan for 15 years. We only bring in 300 people a year into the study site, and only six people a day. And 60% of the revenue goes towards the community, and they provide all the services, boats, homestays, transportation, meals, <coughs> guiding. And although it's a very small, focused, it, it doesn't contribute 500,000 US a year, obviously, to orang, uh, orangutan conservation. But I try to put 30% of all the revenue generated back into the NGO, where you would pay, or the, the tourists would directly pay for the salaries of guides, patrols, research, and also community projects like uh, scholarships. We don't do any marketing because, again, we're afraid if we get too well known, too big, make too much money, that the government will actually take the project over because wildlife in Asia, oh, in Malaysia at the very least, is owned by the wildlife department, the state government. So if we get too big and they see too much money flowing, they're just going to take us over and then best practices, I don't know where that goes. Seriously, yeah, they might turn it into another Sapilok, they might turn it in, into another Matang, which they have in, in Sarawak, in Kuching. So what I'm trying to say is, and Liz answered this question earlier, can Great Ape Tourism save some populations? And I think they can, but it has to be very well done. It has to be NGO and scientifically backed. You have to have very strict regulations. Um, we are in the book, actually, with Liz, but last year we've made our regulations even more strict. And prior to any guests coming, we have them sign that they are not allowed within X amount of feet. They cannot do this and they cannot do that. If you want the details, you can just ask me later. It can help sometimes, but the community buy-in is another thing. And I, I think most of you here working with Great Apes know how important community buy-in is. The thing is, with 300 people a year, 
we don't contribute that much more to the social economy. And we're trying to increase that, we're trying to increase the margins to actually get the community to believe, at least in the short term, that they see benefits. It's difficult because you see in Rwanda and Uganda, you have nice lodges and you pay quite a bit. In Sabah, we have homestays and most people aren't so comfortable with non-flush toilets, there are no showers, you just scoop a bucket and pour it over your head. The food's not what people are used to and it takes them about two, three days to get used to it before they realize how much fun they're having. <laughs> I'm serious. <laughs> I, I, I beg them, I plead with them, please don't worry about that, you know, you don't have to. But they do, and two weeks later, three weeks later, I get an email saying it's the greatest trip of their lives. But when they're there, they can't flip the switch. So what we're trying to do as well is, with the funds coming in, build modern or western toilets, have private rooms in the homestays, but then you get the community saying, well, now this is not how we live. This is not homestays anymore. We're catering to tourists. And the balance shifts and dynamics change. So I used to be a biologist, but man, this is tough, I tell you. <laughs> um, so I think we're going to have a better discussion instead of me just going on about Sukao. Mm. Thank you. Thank you all for your presentations, and I think there's a, a lot of things to talk about. Uh, I, I wanted to go back to uh, Liz and ask why, as we're talking, you and the others, primarily about the mountain gorilla model, why that might not be appropriate for other uh, great ape communities and, 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 and species. Um, I think that um, there are quite a lot of people in the room who have worked with a number of the other taxa and, and hopefully they will chip in. But um, in, in some cases, it's access to the area. In some cases, it's, I mean, as an example, we know that you can fly into Kigali and be at the park within an hour and be you know, in the edge of the forest and stay in your lovely lodge and in you go. Um, if you're going to, to visit... Um, in the Republic of Congo, you're talking about days and a very complicated trip to get somewhere. It's, no, it's not the same sort of experience, and it's not the same sort of tourist. I think that's, that's the thing. The tourist who is happy with the homestay um, is, not, you know, is not the tourist who comes to Kenya and spends $1,000 a night you know, staying in tented camps it, you know, and, and then adds on the mountain gorilla sector. They're different. They're different sectors of the market, and you might be able to build up your services um, and you might get those people, but you're never going to get the numbers and it's never going to be as easy. So I think that um, I, gorillas are gorillas are gorillas and you can probably, you know, there's an, a lot of the things to do with habituation you can apply across all different areas, um, but gorillas are not orangutans and, and the way you do tourism with orangutans is very different as Ken has said. So uh, there are lessons to be learned. We've done a lot more in terms of behavioral impact studies and disease, uh, disease monitoring, which we've heard about yesterday. So there's lots of lessons to be learned. And what I think is the other taxa could adopt our lessons learned, especially the things that we've done wrong, and, and, and not do those. Um, but, but the context is different. And Praveen, I wanted to ask you about uh, the question uh, that was raised by Anna, and that is managing the tourist expectations. And it was also raised by some of the images we saw. I'm sure you encounter that a lot more. Yes, I think it's an essential part of what we must all do. And the private sector must work with conservation organizations and government on that. But people are going to be disappointed if they don't have those kinds of experiences. Well, I think it's a matter of education and a matter of explanation. Um, as I said, too much tourism and the gorillas will die or other animals will die. So it's in our own interest to have these protocols. And as Liz and Anna said, they're not being maintained terribly well. I went recently with my son. OK, the gorillas also, especially infant gorillas, as you know, are now so habituated and so relaxed, they kind of want to climb all over you. So it gets you know, quite difficult. And unless the ranger is alert, you are kind of interacting far more than, than you should. So it's, but it's an issue we must face, because otherwise, as again, as Liz said, if we have one dramatic disease, we'll suddenly see that this isn't working. 
and the risks of spreading contamination of diseases is, is tremendous. Mm. Uh, it, it cuts both ways. Um, uh, the other factor I wanted to ask you about, though, is as you were talking about revenue generation, do you see profit? Uh, and, and Anna, why don't we ask you this as, as, as uh, something that is uh, inimical to conservation? And actually, profit is the reason why the conversion of the habitat was stopped, because there was profit being generated from those forests remaining forests. So I think in terms of the profit angle, um, what we need to look at is how are decisions being taken? How are decisions being taken in terms of furthering, further developing tourism? I mentioned two infrastructure projects, for example, that are slated um, with the idea that this would improve access of, of tourists to different sites, improve the tourist experience. Um, but those decisions are being taken based on a potential further revenue without looking at the potential imp implications to the same species that's driving your tourism, for mm -hmm. example. So it's not really a, a question of the profits, but how are decisions being taken? And we're increasingly getting to a scenario where, you know, mountain gorillas, that's the context I can talk about, are looked at as assets. Um, so you hear this word asset a lot um, when it relates to, to mountain gorilla mountain gorillas in the habitat. Um, so that's where the challenge lies. This is, this is the reality we face um, and working with the protected area authorities um, to really elevate the role of conservation and how it's connected to tourism. That's where, that's where our challenge lies. And that leads though to the uh, expressions I've read in reading about this a little bit, that the wildlife has to pay its own way. And then some. That's not a bad thing. If the wildlife pays its own way, there's a better chance we'll save it. Otherwise, those oil trucks we saw yesterday, they'll be moving in. Again, the map you were possibly not here yesterday, but there was a map of the Albertine Rift in Uganda, Rwanda, and Congo. And as nature would have it, where the assets of the tourism are, are exactly where the oil and mineral assets are. So if you are, if you are running a government, if you, you know, as the president of Rwanda and Uganda and the DRC do, if oil gives you more money for your country, you are likely to be tempted by it. Now, tourism can never compete with that, but at least if it can start generating more, and it is an asset and you do a business plan and say Queen Elizabeth National Park or Park de Virunga can take so many visitors sustainably, ethically, without negative effects, bring about these amount of visitors, I think that's a powerful business case. And Ken, in your case, you were telling me just before uh, that just this year, uh, your project is breaking even. Uh, it, it raises the question of what uh, you were, you were raising the question of what if you start generating too much income? What if you can't pay your way? Well, because we limit the intake of tourists to 300 a year right now, there, there's a limit anyways of how much we can make. And Why do you limit it? Because we work with wild orangutans and it's an active research area. We only bring tourists in to see or to view habituated orangutans. And of the 35 that are in the research site, only three are habituated. And we don't want to increase the pressure on the orangutans at all. I mean, best practices, I suppose. But there's, there will be a cap to how much we can make. Liz? I just wanted to add that um, when we do, we're, we're using the word profit, but I think we need to step back and, and we're talking about uh, we're talking about non we're talking about nonprofit institutions. We are talking about surplus to be reinvested in conservation. So if you make more money than you than you than your operation costs, you're making a surplus and you're using that to fund conservation efforts. And in the cases that have been very successful, you might be con uh, investing your surplus in other conservation areas, in protected areas that can't generate income. You know, we, we know that's been the case in Uganda. They're funding a lot of game reserves that, do, that don't earn any income, but with the money surplus that's coming from guerrilla tourism. So I think... And I would like to add, maybe in five, six years when we, we get a bit more surplus, we are looking at buying land for conservation. And it's very expensive mm -hmm. because of palm oil. And Anna, we've uh, talked about the, the threats of extractive industries, and logging and agriculture, encroachment on habitat. Uh, where you work also, uh, there is the threat of political instability and war. 
There are, and I think that, that plays into this equation of, of can, can tourism save great ape species is that, you know, in, in, in the years where things were stable in the Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo, that tourism was really on the rise. It was really a positive thing. And one instant um, in, in April last year, that all crumbled. So again, you know, it cannot be a panacea. We cannot look at it as this being the end all be all for, for conservation. We have to have backup plans and, and all that in place because again, the revenue is meant to feed back into conservation, both you know, within the parks and also that link back to communities. Again, to raise the standard of living and improve attitudes toward the park. That system <coughs> breaks down all those additional benefits that I talked about in terms of those opportunities, extreme conservation. With insecurity, we can't get those benefits. Um, tourism enterprise, we can't get those benefits in that situation. Revenue sharing, so the whole system breaks down. I want to go to the audience shortly, uh, but I, I want to, uh, being an alarmist, ask each of these people what worries them the most. Uh, and I wanted to begin, Liz, with you. Uh, what worries me the most is that every time I read a proposal for a new uh, project to be developed in a great ape site, every single one mentions that they're going to develop ecotourism and it's impossible to do it in so many sites and that worries me. Anna. And what worries us the most in, in terms of IGCP is a lot of these decisions that are being taken in terms of developing tourism even further are, are decisions that are being taken even outside of the realm of, of in some cases, the protected area authorities that we work in. We're not having a seat at the table early enough to really bet all these different potential impacts and, and have that conversation. Praveen? I think my concerns that I see in Africa, as I said, are the huge pressures on the urban environment, on the built environment, and now almost as big pressures on the natural environment. And coupled with that, the huge increasing demand from tourism from, from tourists from the rich countries on what they expect and the consumption and the pressures that, pay, that puts on poor countries. Expect both in terms of uh, their ability to interact with animals, but also their expectations in terms of uh, hot and cold running water. Absolutely. The homestay, I love the idea of homestay. When I was a child in Africa, we had nothing. We never wanted for anything. Now what our guests want is beyond, is beyond belief. So um, you're lucky if the homestay model lasts. I don't know how long it will last. Uh, Ken, we know your biggest worry is success. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's unregulated expansion because compared to Rwanda and Uganda, wildlife tourism or orangutan tourism in, in Southeast Asia is still pretty small comparative to overall tourism. And when more people start coming and then you have guidelines or practices that are not obeyed, that's, that's going to be an issue. Uh, let's see if we can get some uh, questions here. Um, th this woman in, in the back here. Thank you. Uh, my name is Anna Frosting. I'm an attorney with the Humane Society of the United States. And I just wanted to point out that US federal law currently explicitly allows members of the public to directly interact and touch primates at exhibition facilities. And we are working to change that domestic policy in part because of the conservation concern that people who are involved in that type of exhibition have an increased desire to get closer to apes in the wild through these ecotourism projects. And so I just wanted to hear if anyone on the panel has thoughts about that and would encourage everybody in the room to support that effort. Thanks. Liz? I just have one concern about that. I, it's quite interesting to me. It's been a long time since I've lived in the U.S., but the U.S. is so liability um, uh, lawsuit phobic, phobic. I'm quite surprised that anybody recommends anybody touches a primate. Mm -hmm. the, the, you know, the, the injury risk, the disease risk, there's so many risks. I'm surprised. Thanks. Uh, it's an interesting discussion, and I, I just wanted to echo some of the concerns that Liz raised about whether or not Mount Gorilla tourism can be a template for tourism and for supporting conservation for other apes, and really across the majority of the range of all African apes at least, ecotourism, or sorry, guerrilla tourism as it's practiced in Rwanda is, is not replicable. And that, I think that, gets, that is often lost in the discussion of guerrilla tourism supporting conservation because there, is, there are so many differences about mountain gorilla biology, the habitat where they live, the countries where, they, where they're found, that are not the same in Central or West Africa. 
Um, and so I, I think we really need to be cautious about considering that as the model for, for, for guerrilla conservation and how guerrilla conservation can be funded. And then secondly, this issue of, that, that is often thrown around of wildlife has to pay for itself. The example given of the first national park in, in the United States, which is not that far from here, n national parks in the United States don't have to pay for themselves. And national parks in, other in most countries around the world, in, at least within the developed world, don't have to pay for themselves. So I think that is also a, a dangerous way to think about wildlife and biodiversity. Uh, but you said an interesting thing, developed world. And uh, of course, you know, you're right. Uh, the National Park Service is considerably subsidized by uh, the federal government. But this is not the case. If you're not going to get the income uh, supported from tourism, where else is it going to come but, from? Because but, but, when those, but when that National Park s system was set up, the U.S. was not exactly a, a, a world power. It was a relatively, no. poor, relatively mm. insular country. And the national parks were set up specifically to preserve wildness and nature and what we now call biodiversity. I, so I, 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 I just think it's a little bit, they didn't have the same kind of development pressures, the same kind of development. They certainly had some, but not the same kind. But uh, Anna, if the, if the money's not coming from there, where is it coming from? Well, I was just going to jump on this idea of using it as a model because it's something that I see in IDCP a lot that you end up hearing, you know, when things are glossed over very superficially, that yes, this mountain gorilla model can be applied different places and, and from where we sit, you know, the, the hand is up and saying, wait a minute, you know, we haven't gotten to the vision uh, of where mountain gorilla, you know, where tourism can, can play a role here. And so I agree with you on that side. From where we sit with a successful model, um, we still, you know, don't like to see this being touted superficially to other great ape species. Privy? In my experience, you're absolutely right. The mountain gorilla, of course, is the world's laziest animal. It's lazier than the average urban person now. It, it, doesn't, move, it doesn't move at all. It sits there watching television all day, uh, except when it runs out of food. So that is a difficult model to replicate. You're right. On the other hand, with chimpanzees, for example, as tourism, it works fine. Although, again, the tourism expect expectation is quite high because chimps, of course, are much more mobile. You don't see them so well, They're, they don't hang around and whatever, but it works. And in my experience of visiting, although half a dozen of the Congo uh, Basin states, and certainly Emma will know that, we looked at this together, it's a different sort of tourism. But the choices you have to decide are do you do nothing and have vast swathes of the Congo Basin unconnected to the world, or do you somehow try and connect them? The Salines, the Bais of Mbeli Bai, of Langue Bai, of the, you know, the different Bais, in, in, in Zanga Zanga or in Gabon, they offer a tougher tourism. Uh, as you know, the bugs are huge. Emma will remember that from my last visit. We had various incidents with that. The temperatures are not good. It's, not, it's a hostile environment, but it is an experience for the right sort of tourist. And if you charge enough, and if you provide the right services at the, at the best level, you could charge thousands of dollars a day, which would then fund conservation to a small extent. So there are ways of tweaking the model, and it's still making a contribution. Ecotourism, in my experience, by definition, has a sustainability component. So what do you think that the governments of Rwanda, Uganda, and Borneo, um, are they aware of the notion of the tipping point, of the maximum amount of tourists that they can handle, given the, the rise in pollution, um, noise, traffic, et cetera? Because now it just seems like there's, it's runaway. In my, in my experience, it's just been like, this just keeps growing and growing and growing, and the, the, park, the park permits keep going up and up and up. There's got to be a point, a max out number and price. So my, my question is, are you aware if the governments are even talking about this? Is it part of their plan, part of their ecotourism or sustainability plans in these countries? Anna? Then actually, I would, I would turn that over. If we're, if we're looking at uh, Rwanda and Uganda, we have representatives from the protected area authorities that we work with, better positioned than myself to respond. Uh, for, the, for Rwanda, the, the government have given the, the, uh, the authority to the wildlife uh, management to give uh, rules, rules and regulation. You know, there is a number of limit number of tourists per day. Uh, in terms of uh, pricing, the pricing is not really, uh, there is no ceiling on it. 
that's recently Rwanda took the decision of raising from 500 to 750. I don't know if I respond to your question. Uh, Ken, I wanted you to respond in terms of Borneo. Yeah, um, again, orangutan tourism is still, unless it's government run where you have uh, rehabilitated orangutans in centers, as far as I know, there's no limit, but the, the I don't know how to say this, the bad news is <laughs> there's no more orphaned orangutans being brought in because the height of palm oil expansion has stopped in North Borneo. I know it's not true for Kalimantan or Sumatra, but for North Borneo it is, so they might have to think about that. Um, they do, the government does have limits on special areas or areas of concern, but I, I don't think it's scientifically based, or there's, there's no plan in place to... And Liz, I wanted to ask you, in, in your best practices, document, you talk, uh, we we're talking about tipping points in terms of expansion, you talked about the limitations of the market. Well, yes, I, um, the market can only bear a, a certain number of people, and I do think that uh, mountain gorillas are the exception, um, and, and I'm not saying that that is a positive exception, the fact that every single gorilla group in Rwanda is habituated for either research or tourism means you've, you've reached that point because you just can't go any further at, because there just aren't any more gorilla groups. I'm not actually sure that should be emulated anywhere else. In fact, it worries me extremely. Um, and I think that the market, the market for, the, for other sites is much, much smaller. And it, the, the, the challenge for all of us is to think about where it might be appropriate and which very small number of sites. It might be, might be one, you know, one site in, in, in one country or one site in, in, uh, in, a, in a taxon. You don't need every single group of bonobos to have an ecotourism program. You, tourists just won't come. Um, so I think that that, that is, is, is a real issue and it is, it's very worrying and the market will not bear it. So any, any tourism project needs to have a market analysis before it even considers going ahead. But if there is a relationship between survival of these groups and tourism, does that mean abandoning those other populations of apes to extinction? I, th I think it's finding alternate sources of, of sustainable financing for those, for those sites. So you need a suite of financial incentives. And, and I think we've had people discussing the other options in some of the other panels, but yes. Exactly. And each of these places has the potential of some sites that have world-class tourism possibilities. And I think we all know them, those of us who know these places. So you could just concentrate on those. And at least that would be a, a model, a working, functioning contribution to the economy. And these things do matter. I mean, there's a very successful bonobo sanctuary run by Claudine outside Kinshasa. Um, you know, and that's the only place easily that the world can go and see bonobos. Um, now, if we could, you know, get a way to go and see the bonobos in the wild in the, in the Congo basin, in, in the middle of the Congo, you would get customers, so to speak, who would buy that product. And structured rightly, that would contribute to conservation. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, okay, you're next. Hi, my name is Jenny. Um, I'm from James Madison University. And I just had a question in terms of minimizing the impact. Um, I know I've done some volunteer work before where you have to get a very extensive range of immunizations, even those required beyond US and other country entry requirements. Um, and even things like a annual flu shot, you have to show that you've had that the past few years. And I was just wondering, um, it's, it's been two or three years, but I seem to remember when I did the gorilla trekking that we had to sign a form saying we were in good health, but that I didn't have to turn over the same list of vaccination records. And I wondered um, why that wasn't part of that particular program, or if you were more worried about other things like a common cold, et cetera. Liz? Um, I, I'll take the opportunity to answer that. The, the disease and zoonosis team that had a, had a panel yesterday covered some of the disease issues, and I also have a history with the Mountain Gorilla Vet program. So um, the, the thing that is of, of frightening, I actually think those vaccination protocols are very, very valid, and we've included them in the best practice guidelines. However, it's the things that you can't vaccinate for that, that you should be the most worried about, and therefore, every tourist should be controlled and should be um, educated to think that they are an extreme risk 
from, um, from viruses that are not, there are no vaccinations to, to prevent them. The, also, the thing is you, in, in some of these sites that do require vaccination, you can have your vaccination today and visit tomorrow, and that has absolutely zero effect. So, um, you know, you, there is a benefit of the vaccination requirements, and that has an education component. The tourist says, oh, okay, you know, this is serious, I'm really at risk, and maybe they're more likely to follow the rules. The other slightly controversial recommendation that we're dis dis discussing quite a lot in the field now is um, tourists wearing, wearing masks, wearing surgical masks. So that I I'd want. go for quarantine. It, some of the research sites have quarantine because they can. People can mm. be asked not to go into the field for two weeks on arrival from an international origin on a flight. So that is, that is an option. Mm. But um, I'm not sure if Praveen could get his, give his high-paying his high tourists two weeks of other activities on the way. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's a, a woman in the back who's, you know, I, I've ignored, I apologize. Hi, thank you. Um, I'm Martha Robbins from Max Planck Institute for Evolutionary Anthropology. Um, and I've been involved with Mount Gorilla Research for a while, and I co-manage one of the projects Praveen was talking about where we're trying to set up a public-private um, partnership with Ape Tourism in Luanga National Park in Gabon. And one of the underlying things I think you're all trying to say is that tourism is a one of a plate of conservation strategies, and it's not the only strategy. And similarly, I'm, I'm seeing a theme here that also came up in some of the sessions yesterday where we, we need to sit down together and it's a partnership between governments, NGOs, and private industries to work together. Um, and then lastly, I'd just like to comment a bit on, and putting in perspective why, you know, following on Rich's point where, you know, gorilla, mountain gorilla tourism as a, a template for other places. And, and just to put it in perspective, Current, last year, more than 70,000 people went to see mountain gorillas in Rwanda and Uganda combined. About 500 people went to see western gorillas in the only two places where there's habituated western gorillas. And those sites are a royal pain to get to. It, it takes several days. Um, and also in terms of just differences in habituation, and you know, it really can be country specific. Uh, the, the project where we're we have semi-habituated Western gorillas. Hopefully in about a year we'll be ready for tourism. It's gonna to cost more than a million euros or about you know, million, 1.3 million dollars to habituate one group of gorillas over about eight years. Um, and it's been a struggle to get that. And that money is, half of it's coming from private industry, half of it's coming from uh, research institute, but that project, we, we are jointly doing that as a research, tourism, and conservation approach. And so again, we're, we're working together, but we are struggling to get that funding. And this is in Gabon, where, you know, a million dollars, they, they raise more than that in oil revenue in a day. And like, you know, the, 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 rev the community revenue that you're talking about in Rwanda, a half a million dollars in a year for an area that has more than a million people in it, and again, putting it in that perspective of another country that has an oil economy like Gabon, a half a million dollars is a drop in the bucket economically for them. So it, it, it really depends on the country, again, following on what Rich said, and that tourism is, is one of a, a plate of conservation strategies, and it, the, the three sectors, again, public, private and, and NGOs need to sit down together and really think about it as a strategy overall. Hmm. Uh, Ken, uh, just uh, raising a point, how much does it cost or have you worked this out to habituate one orangutan? <laughs> well, the NGO has been running for 15 years, so salaries for 15 years for 10 staff, quite a bit. And are you calculating the costs as you look at, toward expanding the program? Uh, no, because the NGO actively uses a research site anyways. They permit the uh, company, which is community-based, to utilize that. Mm -hmm. So we don't look at it from a cost stand standpoint at all. Okay. But it is expensive. Yeah. Hi, so I just want to build on what Martha says. I think it's important just to have that perspective of what's going on in, in Central Africa. I, I just want to add, too, that you know, in Gabon and Congo, there is enormous pressure to develop tourism from the governments. Like Gabon created 13 national parks in 2002. That was almost purely on the basis of ecotourism being available. 
there is phenomenal pressure um, in developing ecotourism. It hasn't really got going yet. The same thing in northern Congo, less, slightly less than in Gabon. But if you think that WCS wanted to start doing ecotourism, then we certainly didn't, but we had absolutely no choice under enormous government pressure for that. So I think it's not, you know, these aren't, oh, shall we, shan't we? It, it, it has to be done. So it's now a question of what model is going to work and, and how that's, and it, it's all NGO funded, as Martha says. You know, it's, it's, and it's, it's, it's incredibly expensive and quite stressful, actually. And, and, and let me ask, does the government uh, provide the kinds of security and uh, enforcement uh, that these parks would require, or are these what are sometimes called paper parks? No, I mean, you know, where ecotourism is being, is being initiated is where NGOs are already working, so um, then they are contributing to protection in those areas. Mm -hmm. um, certainly in, in, in northern Congo, the, the government itself invests little financially in um, protection. Um, so, I mean, we do, you know, speaking from WCS, we do have limits. We would never initiate an ecotourism project, even if we didn't want to, where we didn't feel that, that apes were, were, were secure or, or properly protected. But I do just want to put, just to add that there is phenomenal, particularly in Gabon, huge government pressure in getting that working. Mm -hmm. and, Pete, and sorry, just to add, and tourists, when they come to that region, they, they only want to see gorillas. They don't want to see elephants. They can see those in Botswana. They want, they want to see gorillas. So. But, um, basically, uh, we have that parallel. We have that experience in, in Uganda. The, the two parks that were created that have mountain gorillas within them in Uganda, Bundi and also the Mgihinga Gorilla National Park, were gazetted as national parks because the government wanted to start gorilla tourism. So the parallel is there. And um, I would say for at least one of those parks, it, we would have lost that gorilla population if tourism hadn't started. So it was on a downward, downward trend and tourism is what brought it back up and the government buy-in for the conservation of that forest was because of the income from tourism. So it's the, it's I think the same. Liz has answered the question, hasn't she? That's the classic example. There was a forest going nowhere. People were going to cut it down and make it into toast, literally, and have it for agricultural land. And the gorillas would have disappeared. And the government said, hey, wait a minute. We've got all these poor people that are a big inconvenience. We could do tourism here, create a national park, win-win. So, you know, there are ways where it can work. It's, it can provide limited money. It will never provide as much as oil, but it's, it's there. So. Yeah, yes, sir? Thanks. Got to move around to be seen. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. <laughs> Tunnel dish. <laughs> been jumping around all over the place. Anyway, uh, I'd like to comment from the perspective of a practicing primate ecotourist. I've been spending the better part of the last 40 years uh, trying to see many, many different species of primates in the wild and going to many, many sites on, on all the continents in which uh, primates occur. I'm a big believer in, in primate ecotourism, and in fact, I'm trying now to stimulate uh, primate life listing and primate watching as a model based on the extremely successful model of, uh, of bird watching. The last number I heard was bird watching was like a $38 million, $38 billion industry. And those bees are important, yeah. Yeah, the bees are important. And, uh, they're the most amazingly network connected community I have ever seen. My son is a, is a major bird watcher, so I've been really learning a lot from what he's doing. Uh, a few comments about primate ecotourism. Obviously, you've got to use best practices, and obviously, you've got to uh, have conservation as the primary objective. But I want to point out that every single species has, al has already been said in relation to Rwanda, Virungas, and, and Central Africa, every single species, every single region has a different set of realities. Apes are particularly difficult, especially African apes, because they spend a lot of time on the ground and because they're so closely related to us. It's a lot, and they're hard to habituate. It's a lot easier in places like Madagascar. I'm desperate to have more primate ecotourism sites in Madagascar, because that is the only thing right now, the only thing in the absence of a functioning government that convinces people that these animals and their forests are worth conserving. And in so many cases, although it has lots of problems and we have to continue to refine it and improve on it, in most cases, it's the best quick fix to convince people that destroying those forests is not a good idea. I wonder with Rwanda, and I've been following the situation in Rwanda since the 70s, I wonder if the Virungas wouldn't all be a big pyrethrum plantation right now if it were not for mountain gorilla tourism. So let's really, and I think, Liz, I think you're underestimating the potential market. I think we can develop more sites, obviously using best practices, but I think we can develop through marketing a much bigger market for primate watching, make it competitive the way bird watch watching is, and, and really get more people out to more places and encourage more communities and more national governments to, 
to do whatever possible to conserve these animals and to protect their, uh, their habitats. Thanks. I might just add that while we're doing that, let's instill this sense of, of why people are going to see great apes from the beginning and that mentality of, of having a wonderful experience from me to you instead of from me to Ken right from the beginning as, as those kind of things do come up. Thank you. I, uh, I just want to reiterate Sorry. what he was saying about <laughs> ebirds.org because of the Cornell University. And I, over the last couple of days, we've been talking about getting data and knowing all the stuff that's going on with all the different primates in all of Africa and not knowing, and, and also um, Sumatra and Borneo. And how do you consolidate that? And at the Cor Cornell University, the science citizens, scientists, citizen scientists or whatever, People are sending in all this information. It's, it gets collected. Then scientists, real scientists, figure out what it means, and you have a central way somehow of seeing what is really happening in all these different areas with all the different forms of the primates. So I think it's a brilliant idea to try to involve the very tourists that are coming that are concerned that really want to preserve the wildlife that is on this planet. And I think that we have to get people involved in that capacity and that could be another form of doing it rather than just showing up paying a lot of money. Because there are people all over the, the world coming, and I'm just, I'm so excited about this, I'm gonna talk to somebody afterwards because I know I'm rambling. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just wanted to make another point about guerrilla tourism. There was a project in Gabon for more than 10 years I think Chris knows how many years, which was attempting to habituate gorillas for tourism and it shut down because it was, it, it failed. It, it was not able to habitu habituate the gorillas or attract the tourists. So this is not an unqualified success. Uh, at the, the yeah, um, I would like that uh, probably Liz could uh, <coughs> uh, try to explain to the people that there's a flip, si uh, flip side of uh, tourism. You know, when you look at places like uh, uh, Kinigi in uh, Rwanda, where you know, tourism have really uh, helped to increase the livelihood of some of the, the community, you know, the price of uh, potatoes for some of uh, the participants here who have been in Rwanda, in 95, uh, for example, 2000 was three, I mean, 30 to 50 franc, Rwandan franc. Today, because of tourism, tourism booming, there's a lot of hotels. You know, for the local uh, communities, the same kilo, kg of uh, potatoes is now 200, almost 200 francs. So there's a difference. That I think uh, I didn't, you know, uh, didn't see it uh, be raised. But we need to be very careful on uh, tourism. There's a flip side. Mm. Thank you, uh, uh, Praveen. I wanted to ask you about that because obviously the kinds of services that you provide demand a lot of infrastructure, demand a lot of development, demand a lot of vehicles, a lot of other things. So, so what, what do you want uh, to Just to follow up on his point, because uh, the uh, presence of, of wealthy tourists distorts the local economy. Totally. And you, that has, of course, both positive and negative elements. Uh, as Tony says, you suddenly get people who were used to paying a certain amount for a commodity, and it shoots up. Um, or they're just used to seeing people who are much richer than they are who have so much, and it is, it is confusing for them, so that you can get beggars, for example, you can get theft, massively we don't see a lot of it, and you can get resentment. Uh, I think, luckily in our areas, there's, I don't know, the people are mild, they're gentle, they're welcoming, they, they accept the change reasonably well. As you know, in some of the major resorts in certain countries where thousands of Americans go not far away, <laughs> um, I think you can create much more tensions. So I think it's, 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 part, it's part of the education. I mean, none of our lodges is fenced in any way, and we don't get any problems because we try and work with the community. And for example, in these performances or cultural things we have, we invite the community to come and be part of the community in our lodge. Because otherwise, again, you create the tension and the rich people looking at the poor. So I think these are lessons that we must all do. We are invading other people's uh, home areas, and we must be you know, sensitive about that. Ken, you have a different model, um, much more community-based, yet that is going to be, as you grow, more difficult to sustain. Well, uh, I, I didn't give you the whole picture. In Suka, we're not the only tour operator. There's about six or seven others. 
they don't hire community, no money goes into community. So the reason this company was set up was to give community a little bit of revenue from ecotourism. Uh, but the prevailing economy there is palm oil. And a lot of, even people that work with us, they have their own plantations. So, sorry, ecotourism in itself, in Sukkot right now, it's, it, the revenue there isn't enough. It, it doesn't destabilize. And I know you would never want to denigrate your competitive com competition, but uh, compare your practices to theirs. They have no practices. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. it, they're, not, they're not allowed to go into the forest. We're the only ones allowed by the wildlife department to enter the protected areas. So they stay on the rivers, although they, they do sell themselves as orangutan tourism, but... Do they sell themselves as ecotourism? <sighs> yes, yes. Uh, most of them do. And I, I think they, they mistake... Uh, nature-based or wildlife-based tourism for ecotourism. There's a lot of greenwashing. Well, I think there's a marketing advantage to calling yourself an ecotourist company. Uh, is there any prospect, I find this hard to imagine, of uh, labeling this like organic? There's some meaning to this. Liz? Um, if I understand you correctly, I think that was the, the idea that you might consider certifying, having some yes. definitions you might say, well, we're going to apply these criteria and therefore we can use the term mm -hmm. X, maybe not organic, but um, yeah. something. Something, um, some equivalent. Something, yeah, something, some equivalent. So I think that there, there is an option. The, the point is if you are in a place where people don't have a choice, if, if they don't, they can't choose between, uh, it's not a question of two companies, it might be, you know, a national park and that's it, that's a single source provider. You don't have an option to go to another, to a competitor. Mm -hmm. But in places where there are com competitive operations, then having mm -hmm. a definition and allowing people to use that to market themselves would be great. Anna? And I was just going to add that, that this idea of having the, the standards and then looking at regulation in terms of certification, for example, is something that is being explored for mountain gorilla tourism as well, recognizing that, yes, well, there is standards. Maybe we need some sort of mechanism so we partnered with Wildlife Friendly Enterprise Network, and in the next few months, there'll be a feasibility study. Again, not, not driven from the conservation perspective only, but taking all the partners in the room to look at how can we do this in a way that we do identify those practices and, and those who are performing those practices get some sort of market reward. Um, I was wondering about the um a little bit about the educational aspect of gorilla or great ape tourism in general. Um, do you feel that tourists walk away with really a real understanding of how critically endangered these individuals are, or do they walk away the, with a complacency that, well, this area is very protected and this is going to sustain the populations long term into the future? Um, and then uh, another question, sort of unrelated, is there any um, possibility that demand for um, primates, um, particularly the apes, the illicit trade, is it all driven by um, tourism where, you know, well, I would like one of these individuals, you know, in my home, in my country, at my zoo, in my circus? Uh, in terms of the first part, Praveen, I think uh, I'd like to hear from you. I think it's a mixed picture. I think some people then, as you say, get a complacent feeling. They think, wow, I've seen these, they're protected. This is fine. I can touch them. This is okay. And others are very sensitive that this is a very rare privilege. I mean, Diane Fossey, as you'll know, said this could be the century, the 20th century, where we discovered the gorilla and we killed it. Now, luckily, that hasn't happened, but it is precarious. So I think it is the education aspects. I think we could all do more. And I think maybe I would recommend to Liz that the IUC, IUCN at least gets out one page and circulates to, to tourism companies for different species through the associations. So we all remind ourselves that this is what we should be doing. Uh, on the second part, on the international trade part, I, 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 are you qualified to talk about that, Liz? Um, I, well, it would be nice to open it up to the room a little bit, because I don't think I've ever seen a case where someone has left and said, oh, yes, I want one. Can I, you know, can I go home with one? Uh, but but <laughs> maybe joking. somebody else can. Maybe jokingly, yes, that's yes. true. Everybody, even I want one. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but no. This morning, in the session said that when people went to Ngamba, where the chimp sanctuary is in Uganda, where the confiscated chimps are, 
But people often said, you know, I'd wanted a chimp of my own, but now that I've seen <laughs> you know, how precarious this all is, I'm not going to have one. So there's a question over there. Yeah. Th thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I think we've covered a lot of the points, but there's one thing that I, I seem to feel we're missing. All the focus, all the conversation has been about international tourism. There is domestic tourism. There are people within the range state who go and see the apes. And that is the most powerful form of conservation education you can experience. Certainly in Rwanda, I've met Rwandan couples who've come to see what all the fuss is about. And they come away absolutely blown away by the experience of visiting the gorillas. And they go back and talk about it in Kigali. And I'm sure the same happens in, in Malaysia, where there are some very wealthy families who can certainly afford to, and they see it as a new experience, what's all this fuss about apes, go and see them. And that, that will convince them that the demand that used to exist, I want an ape in my backyard because it's a status symbol, will be transformed into a conservation awareness. So let's not forget that not all tourists arrive on an international jet. Some of them just come down the road. Uh, Ken, I wonder, has this uh, been a factor in, in Borneo? In the last two years, we'd have, we'll have two Malaysian tourists. And they only came because their boyfriends were American and Australian. <laughs> in, in Malaysia, you can go to Sepilok or Matang, uh, to see rehabilitated orangutans, and it's cheaper, and it's in town, and you fly in and you fly out, and then you have it. You know, we we run a minimum three-day program where we try and educate you on on conservation of the species in in Borneo. So it's a mm -hmm. bit different. Yeah. It's a marketing opportunity. Marketing yes. opportunity. Get some Malaysian celebrities. Oh, we, we, we've we've, we've, we've had them. them. We've had them visit, but no no uptake. Mm -hmm. Liz? And I just wanted to supplement, um, when you all read the best practice guidelines, which we all hope you're going to go home and do now. Th um, this going to be a quiz <laughs> after? <laughs> there, we, we do may, you know, include the provision that booking systems and pricing structures are such that domestic tourism is encouraged. But I wanted to ask the, um, the orangutan team, the Sumatran group, because I think you, uh, from what I've seen from, uh, from personal observation, that there are huge numbers of tourists that come to the areas, whether they would take up an orangutan guided visit, but they do come, they're really interested in, in nature. You have quite a, quite a lot of visitors, am I right? Uh, yes, we have um, a bit of a circus there, you can call yeah. it. I think we have one place where most tourists go to. It's, a, it's an ex-rehab site. People pay, um, I think, $2 to get in to the national park there and view the orangutans. So there's very little revenue going to the national park authorities. Um, there's some revenue going to the local people, of course, that live in that village, but it's totally uncontrolled. The picture that you saw there earlier uh, was from that area. There's a lot of uh, issues there with or anything, stealing bags, uh, biting people, etc. cetera. Um, but that's about the only place we have, uh, in addition to a, a small area where people can potentially see if they're really lucky um, unhabituated wild orangutans, but it's an odd situation because I get emails almost every day from, from people that want to see wild orangutans, and the only thing I can do is send them to Kenish because that's the only place there is where there is proper uh, wild orangutan tourism. But it's weird. That's only 300 people a year for Borneo and Sumatra where there is a good opportunity to see orangutans, and I personally would like to see some more opportunities for people there that are well regulated and I know that's difficult in Indonesia, it's a real challenge in Malaysia, it's also a challenge, but if we don't do it, th there is a risk as well because the habitat is under so much threat. So I think it's for the orangutans worthwhile to at least try it in one or two more locations and see whether we can do it properly. I'm a little concerned about the uh, economics of the uh, ecotourism. Um, in a lot of these countries, you know, we're using ecotourism as a tool to alleviate some of the poverty uh, and the disparity of wealth, uh, which may lead to uh, either hunting of bushmeat or the trade of live animals. Um, in these eco parks uh, or lodges, um, I understand that there's you know, owned in part by NGOs and governments and also in the private sector. But these private companies, uh, this question is for Liz, uh, in your review of um, these locations for ecotourism, how many are actually owned at the top tier uh, by nationals in these countries? 
By, you mean how many of the How many of the camps, lodges and... Camps and lodges. Yeah. I've, um, that's quite, that's an interesting statistic that I can't answer, but I would say that many, many, even if they have, uh, even if they are, are locally owned or on local land, there is an external partner that helps with, with, uh, with marketing and, um, and training. So I can't answer you in terms of percentage, but um, I think even, I, I live in Kenya, the, the, the model in Kenya is that many of the community owned enterprises still have an international partner. So, so are, are we not at all concerned that the tourism itself is extractive economically for these areas? Um, and that the money, I mean, to, to hear $500,000 in a year is a little concerning. Um, it's, it's just not that much, much money going back to these communities, which in the first place we're looking at, at ecotourism battling that disparity of wealth and really uh, being, you know, a tool to, uh, you know, address poverty. And, and is that really happening because of uh, really the ownership of these, uh, these ventures? Praveen. Well, you know, it's back to that cliche of the global economy. Nobody's stopping the world in, uh, next to the Randy's Gorilla Park that Tony mentioned in Kinigi or around Windy, people from that area to set up campsites. And a number said Windy. Well, Liz, by the way, started the tourism program. She didn't tell you that. <laughs> anyway, a number of local people have set up campsites and lodgings and homestays. And some have survived in the last 15 years, some haven't, and some have changed hands and whatever. But at their level of capacity and investment, inevitably those are the simpler places. The moment you start having to cater for the high-end American or you know, the high-end European visitor, they don't have the investment, they don't have the capacity. And that's where you know, various outsiders come in, or people like, uh, people like me who are connected to the country because one was born there. So I think that's, it's, a, it's a good philosophical question, but you also have to be practical in my opinion. If you want a country to develop, you need to have the right capacity and the skills and the investment. And I don't mean to cut you off, but we're out of time, and I did promise this one woman uh, over here that she would get a question. Uh, Anna, quickly. quickly. That there are some, some models to look at in terms of, 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 of making sure a big portion of that funds go back to community. So what I didn't say is, is in that 500 and, and some thousand US dollars in revenue generated from tourism enterprise, actually a big percentage of that is from two lodges that IGCP with African Wildlife Foundation have, have, have put in place luxury lodges that are 100% community owned. So there is a private sector partner that is brought in, but the ownership is every citizen over the age of 18 in a specific area. So there are some, there are some models to look at there. I didn't want us to move on without raising And the last question. Yeah, I just wanted to say, I mean, agreeing with something that Martha said earlier is that ecotourism isn't the only answer. And I'm not sure if when Diane Fossey and everyone started this in the 70s of what we have now is what the, their image, is the image that they had then um, with so many animals habituated for research and tourism and you know, whether there really are any wild animals left and why do the gorillas themselves actually have to sacrifice themselves for themselves and why do we see them now as a commodity? I mean, when it started, when we had two or three groups in Buindi and it was sustainable and it was working, why do we now have 10 or 11 groups? And, and you know, have we tipped the balance like you ask in your practical, in your, in your guide? And um, what about the trust um, and the impact of the trust? Can you mention a little bit about the Magahinga and Buindi Trust that also helps with development in the local area? Yeah, Liz, will give you a chance to answer. Um, I think, do we have a panel discussion on sustainable financing coming up uh, in the next few days? I can't remember. No, uh, okay, <laughs> I, thought, I thought maybe we did. Um, but but we, do, um, we do have, they're, they're, these trust funds are, I mean, they're, they're in place for Buindi, they're, are in, they're in place in other great ape sites and there's lots of lessons learned and I would say, yes, they're very good, but they have to be set up appropriately, and many times they are not very well thought through, and they may not be sustainable. So I, I think um, we should maybe next time we all meet, we'll have a discussion about trust funds. But And, and I apologize. Anyway. Obviously, we could uh, pursue other questions, and I, I apologize for 
uh, trimming the conversation there. But we are out of time. I'd like to thank our panelists uh, for taking the time to be with us and for lending us their expertise.